Reading today is from Luke chapter 17, verses 1 through 10. Jesus said to his disciples, Occasions for stumbling are bound to come, but woe to anyone by whom they come. It would be better for you if a millstone were hung around your neck and you were thrown into the sea than for you to cause one of these little ones to stumble. Be on your guard. If another disciple sins, you must rebuke the offender. And if there is repentance, you must forgive. And if the same person sins against you seven times a day and turns back to you seven times and says, I repent, you must forgive. The apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. The Lord replied, if you had faith the size of a mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it would obey you. Who among you would say to your slave who has just come in from plowing or tending sheep in the field, come here at once and take your place at the table? Would you not rather say to him, prepare supper for me, put on your apron and serve me while I eat and drink? Later, you may eat and drink. Do you thank the slave for doing what was commanded? So you also, when you have done all that you were ordered to do, say, we are worthless slaves. We have done only what we ought to have done. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. We come to you asking that you take a a difficult word, a, a hard word, a harsh word of yours, and teach us, Lord, what our hearts need to hear. We pray this in the name of Christ, our Savior and Lord, on this World Communion Sunday. Amen. Back in the 1850s, we have to remember 1850s now, don't think it's today, there were two men in a little part of North Carolina, a place, some of you, if you know North Carolina, I don't know where this is, Rufferton. North Carolina, the name of the town. These two gentlemen were uh, farmer ranchers and had quite a bit of land. They were Southern Baptists, core to the core, through and through, and they had a concern. There were no Baptist schools anywhere in this part of North Carolina. And one of them, uh, uh, Mr. Mr. Carter, what particularly was concerned because his niece and nephew had attended a Methodist school nearby because it was the only one available, and they had now, get this, they converted to Methodism. Bad stuff, right? So his, his son was now about to attend this Methodist school because there was no Baptist school for him to attend, and he was afraid that his son, even his son, might succumb to this crazy Wesleyan theology about grace. And so he and his friend decided they would donate land and get all their friends to donate money, and they would create a Baptist college where these kids could grow up learning the right, right things, right? So they went out and talked to all their neighbors and friends and business people in the area, and they got, they got uh, pledges for $2,000. Now, that doesn't sound like a lot of money, but 1850, remember? This is 1850. That's quite a bit of money. So they got the contractor, and they let the bid. They started to build the, the initial building for this, this Baptist college, and it took shape, it got about two-thirds of the way through, and it became obvious, like lots of you have been a part of building projects uh, recently, maybe your home after the flood or a business situation, it was a cost overrun, it cost more than they thought. So instead of being $2,000, it was $3,100. So they were $1,100 short in being able to pay for the building. The contractor was not happy. He was not happy. He's two-thirds of the way through, He's bought all of the, the supplies and doesn't look like he's going to get paid because none of the donors seem to have deep enough pockets that they could just you know, write a check for that another $1,100 uh, for the rest of the building. So the contractor decided to take matters into his own hands. Remember, this is 1850 again. One of the, one of the donors uh, was a gentleman, a landowner by the name of J.W. Anderson, 
And he, was, he had a slave, a black gentleman who was his slave, named Joe, who was a, a really healthy and strong worker. And so uh, he was of great value. And so the contractor had the sheriff, the local sheriff, take Joe into custody, almost like you would, you would impound somebody's property and put him uh, in jail until the debt could be settled. He was hoping either they would pay for it or they would have to sell Joe in order to raise the money, that $1,100. Didn't have quite the effect that the contractor wanted. The city and all of the inhabitants got really upset because they liked Joe. Joe was a great worker. He was a wonderful uh, family man. And so they, uh, they protested this action by the contractor. And pretty soon, uh, the different, the different uh, donors had come up with the $1,100. They paid him off, and, and Joe was released from the, the county jail, and he was given his freedom as well, not just from the jail, but his freedom to be a free man as well. Today, if you go to that part of North Carolina, you will find that college. It's called Mars Hill College. And in a very small graveyard with just a couple of, of graves, you will find buried in the middle of that college, Joe, the slave who was held uh, for a time until the debt could be paid. But the rest of the story, to use a Paul Harvey kind of uh, uh, twist, is that in 1961, a young lady by the name of Orlean Graves, who is the great-great-granddaughter of Joe the slave, became the first full-time student who was African-American at Mars Hill College. What a great story that is. What a great story. In a tragic time, with a tragic part of our history. But it, it prepares us for some difficult words in this passage. Now, you know, when you look at this passage and listen to what Lynn read, those first, those first six verses, I mean, you've probably heard a thousand sermons on those passages talking about discipline within the body of Christ, talking about forgiveness, and also talking about faith, like a mustard seed, remember? You can make a mountain, you know, move. You just have that little grain of, of faith. Amazing thing. But the last three verses of this passage, I don't know about you, but I'd just as soon like to kind of take that out of the Bible and put it somewhere else. But this is, this is what came up this week for me to wrestle with and to share with you about. And so... We're going to go there, and I will tell you that I, I, I've never preached on this. I don't know if I've heard very many sermons on this, and it becomes very obvious why, because what Jesus teaches in the last three verses here is troubling. It's very troubling. It's disturbing. It doesn't sound like the Jesus that you and I know and love. It doesn't sound that way. Listen again. Who among you would say to your slave, who has just come in from plowing or tending the sheep, come in here at once and take your place at the table. Would you not rather say to him or her, prepare supper for me and put on your apron and serve me while I eat and drink, and later you can eat and drink? Do you thank the, thank the slave for doing what they were commanded? So you also, when you are done all that you are ordered to do, say, we are worthless slaves. We have done only what we were supposed to do. Sounds like Jesus? I don't think so. What tough words. It's offensive. And the very first thing that, that's offensive is it talks about a horrible part of our past. Except it's not all past. Slavery. Slavery. We think that, that slavery is all gone. And in our country, at least the formal... Uh, form of slavery has been gone for 150 plus years, but there's still people that are enslaved in a lot of different ways all around the world. Human trafficking, others, other kinds of ways that that, that happens. Uh, just heard a, a story on, on the TV the other day about people in the seafood industry over in, the, the, uh, in South Korea that are being held in bondage to, to work on ships catching our seafood that we enjoy in our restaurants. It still happens. Slavery is offensive to the people of God. It's offensive. But in Jesus' day, 2,000 plus years ago, slavery was an accepted part of the culture. So much so that Jesus says, talks about many times, if you were a slave, 
to be a, 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 a good slave, to be a slave who followed the, the wishes of your master, right? But it's still difficult. It's still difficult. And so we have this, this, uh, this slave owner in the story who, who has the, the slave come in from tilling the fields and taking care of the, the animals and to serve everyone else before they serve themselves. It, it's hard to hear those words. It's hard to hear those words. And another thing that's offensive in this story is this kind of almost snobbery, right? Almost snobbery. It says, you know, would you invite the, this slave to your table to eat with you? No, heck no. They're going to feed you, and then they can eat in the back. You're going to eat in the big dining room with all the china and the silver and everything else, and they'll serve you. But later on, you're going to let them eat somewhere else in the servants' quarters. I don't know about you, but that ruffles my feathers. I, doesn't, I, I didn't grow up with servants, uh, butlers and maids and others. Some of, not, most of us did not. But this is what is described. It doesn't sound like Jesus, does it? And, of course, that's the point. That's the very point. Jesus has so affected us, those who've chosen to follow him, those who study his teachings, we know he values all persons. We know he loves everyone, whether they're rich or poor, whether they're uh, old or young, whether they're women or men. It doesn't matter. Jesus values all persons. And this lesson strikes at the heart of that. It almost makes us want to say, is that really it? It sounds so elitist, so horrible. And then the last part of this passage really gets personal, doesn't it? It really gets personal. It says, who among you would say to your slave, again, that all those passages, and who would, who would then praise that slave for doing what they were supposed to do? Instead, he says, at the end, after you've done all that you were supposed to do, to remind yourself, you are a worthless slave. You've only done what you ought to have done. Jesus is not talking to the down and out. He's talking to you. He's talking to me. He's talking to those of us who are followers of his. And that's harsh. It's harsh. Jesus is not only calling us worthless slaves, he's also telling us we shouldn't expect anything in return for doing good for his kingdom. Now, a lot of us do that. A lot of us do that. We think if we do enough good things, right, God will owe us. God will have to, to watch out for us more than he will someone else. If we're honest, we've all been there. I mean, after all, we might say to ourselves, well, I've been a, I'd have been a member of, of a church for 25 years. Uh, I've served on the finance committee and the, the PPR committee and missions and evangelism. I've done it all. I taught Sunday school, right? I, I, I've, I've tithed most of the time. We might tell ourselves all those things. So God owes me. I can remember when, when I sat down with my father a short time after my mother was diagnosed with brain cancer, and very unexpectedly, and we sat down for lunch after she had gone into surgery. And I remember him being angry and confused and upset, which is normal at that time. But I remember him saying to me something like this. Your mother is a good Christian woman. She's played the piano and led worship in church for 25 years. She's been a Sunday school teacher for all these years. She's a, the head of the, the, the intercessory prayer group. She prays for people all the time. How could God do this to her? It's not fair. Ever felt that way? This passage says, God doesn't owe us anything. We are like worthless slaves. He's not saying we're worthless, but he's saying we do this not to have gain, not to get him to do things or to somehow uh, have him owe us big time. Instead, in our heart of hearts, we do it because he first loved us, as the scripture said. We do it because he first loved us. And when we come today to this table on World Communion Sunday, we come to this table, we hear words that are ancient and that we've heard a thousand times. 
but hopefully we hear them fresh today, when Jesus says, this is my body broken for you. This is my blood poured out for you. We don't deserve this. We can't earn this. We can't be good enough for this. Paul says if we're trying to earn righteousness, he says it's like filthy rags. It's like trash. We can't do it. It's not possible. But it is a gift. A gift from God poured out for us on this table today. I read a story this week, uh, an old story. A repeat of an old story from a National Geographic. Anybody ever read those when you were a kid? You know, you got a stack of those with all the pictures. and you, It's a way to, before we had social media and internet and a lot of TV channels, it was a way to, to have a, a taste of the world, is to read National Geographic. Well, National Geographic had a, a story in there about Indian society. And if you've ever read anything about Indian society, you know that for 1,500 years or so, they've had what's called the caste system. That is, some people are born uh, to a higher caste, and they, they have the ability to be upwardly mobile, as we talk about, to, to earn, better themselves, to earn more, to own property, go to school, get uh, jobs, etc. But then there are people in the caste system that are born to a lower caste, and the lowest caste is called the untouchables, or in the Indian language it's called Actua. And the Actua, the untouchables, are the ones who are born into that place where they can't own land. They can't better themselves. They have to live in the poorest ghettos of the community, and they're persecuted and put down, and they can't get jobs to better themselves. They're stuck in that place of being an untouchable. Mahatma Gandhi was the one who struck out to help uh, India get its independence from, from Great Britain, but he also had a campaign to help the untouchables get respect, to get rights in India. And so he went around the country in 1933 trying to gain uh, rights for the untouchable caste. And he even went so far as to give them a new name. He gave them a new name. Instead of being the Actua, the untouchable, they became the Haran, which means people of God. Now, I don't know about you, but that'll preach, won't it? To go from being the untouchables to the people of God. That's what this table is all about. You and I are untouchable. We're worthless slaves. We're not ones who can gain our own value or our own uh, uh, acceptability in the sight of God. But at the Lord's table, this table, we find that we are worthy because of the grace and mercy of what Christ did upon the cross. We can have been in the church all of our lives or maybe just for five minutes. It doesn't matter because this is the place where we find out that God died for us. And we're no longer irrelevant we matter to God. We matter to God because in God's timing, in God's kingdom, everybody is invited to this meal. Everyone has a place at this table. All, all are invited to come and sit with the master and partake. You and I are worthy because of the grace and mercy of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. It's great, and part of what's great is that no matter who gathers to worship, the Lord is here. And so next week, I will not be here. I'm going to be gone to my daughter's homecoming in her senior year at college. But we have a guest preacher from Austin Presbyterian Seminary that's going to be here. Some of the lay folks are going to be leading the worship service. Uh, and after that worship service, you're invited to stay around for a uh, sandwich brunch and to help unload pumpkins in the pumpkin patch right below here. I know that sounds funny and some of you think, well, I don't really need to do that. But let me tell you, there's a great ministry that reaches lots of families with children in our community. It, it will be time well spent. So pray about that possibility 
And also, if you want to volunteer to be in the pumpkin patch, go on the website and do so. Now may the Lord who has called us uh, to himself and made us worthy through his son, Jesus Christ, help us this week to go out and see all of those around us who are his sons and daughters, who are in need of his love and grace. Go out now and be the church. Amen. Mm -hmm.